the thing that we want to notice here is that we are reading the derivative of a function. We are looking at little g, and we're told that capital G is an antiderivative of little g. So little g is the derivative of big G. So this is the graph of big G prime. The first question was about reading the uh, sign of the derivative to determine the direction of the function. The question says, on what interval or intervals is capital G increasing? And on what interval or intervals is capital G decreasing? And then to explain. This is where we read the sign of little g, which is the derivative. So since g, uh, little g is big G prime, we'll notice that um, capital G is increasing on the interval from one to four. Big G is increasing on the interval from one to four. I'm going to use strictly less than because at one and at four, uh, the derivative is zero. So the function G is flat. The reason that we say that capital G is increasing on the interval from one to four is that capital G prime, which is little g, is positive. So we'd say since G prime is positive uh, on the one on the interval from one to four. So uh, notice that I wrote my uh, compound inequality to describe my interval. We can also do, write this interval in interval notation. We could say that uh, x is between one and four, not including one and not including four. We can also use interval notation by writing this interval as one comma four. That would be interval notation. This looks like coordinates, but it's not coordinates because I wouldn't say G is increasing on one single point. So we have to get some uh, context here for what we mean when we write one comma four in parentheses. There's another way to write this. So this is interval notation. When we talk about intervals of increase and decrease, we would read this not as the point one, four, but the interval from one to four, not including one, not including four. Another way to write this in interval notation is to write one comma four, and then to indicate that one and four are not included, use square brackets, but turn the square brackets out. So this is another common thing, turn the square brackets out. So the square brackets turn their backs on the one and four because the one and four are not included. So we can describe our intervals either with a compound inequality where X is between the one and the four or with interval notation. The second part of the question is on what intervals is capital G decreasing? And there are a couple of intervals, uh, intervals on, where, on which capital G is decreasing. That's where capital G prime is negative. And that's from zero to one, and then from four to six. So capital G is decreasing on two intervals from zero to one. Notice that capital G prime is also negative at zero. So we can include zero if we want. We want to be super pedantic about it. We'll say less than or equal to X, less strictly less than one. And the interval from four, strictly less than X, but less than or equal to six since G prime is negative.
when I write it this way, I'm just saying it's uh, that capital G is decreasing on these two intervals. So it's appropriate to use the word and in between. If I wanna write this set in interval notation, since we are including the zero, I might say yes, zero, but no to one and no four, but yes, six. Since I want these two intervals together, we could say I want the union of these two sets. So we'll put like a U. It's not a U because some of you will put little tails on your U. It's just a U like that. That's the union symbol. If you want to read the union symbol, you would read it as or. If X is between zero and one or, x is between four and six, then capital G is decreasing. A union is an or. If I write the union upside down, that's an intersection. There is no intersection between these two intervals. So I wouldn't want to say the intersection of these intervals. We might write this if we want to include the zero and exclude the one. So you might also see this. Yes, zero. To exclude the one, we have the bracket turn its back on one. And I don't want the four, but I do want the six. Once we start putting our interval notation in with unions and intersections, these backwards brackets start to get kind of weird looking. I don't know, maybe the whole thing is weird looking. But that's what we would write in interval notation. Since there's two of them, put a union in the symbol in between them. As far as the explanation goes, that's included because I've said capital G is, D is increasing because capital G prime is positive. Capital G is decreasing on this interval since capital G prime is negative. The next question was about concavity, which is a second derivative thing, but we can get that from the first derivative by looking at the direction of the first derivative. So if we look at the first derivative, capital G prime, we see that capital G prime is increasing on the interval from zero up to two. So we'd say capital G is concave up on the interval from zero to two. We say this because we see the derivative is increasing. In interval notation, we would say zero comma two, either in parentheses, that would be the most common way to do it, or in the backwards brackets. My preference, if you're gonna write interval notation is to just use parentheses for interval notation when things are not included. If you personally have a strong objection, it's like, oh, no, 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 
that's how we write ordered pairs. So I'm not going to do it. That's fine. We do backwards right. The other part of the question is where is capital G concave down? That happens when G prime, capital G prime is decreasing. So capital G is concave down on the interval from three to five. Since G prime is decreasing. A quick note, what you're communicating to me, number one, is that you know that when the derivative is decreasing, the function is concave down. You're also in this statement telling me that you've identified the graph of little g as the graph of capital G prime. Notice that on the interval from two to three and from five to six, capital G prime is neither increasing nor decreasing. On the interval from two to three and from five to six, G is neither concave up nor concave down. I didn't ask about this, but we should recognize this. G is neither concave up or concave down on the interval from two to three. And the interval from five to six. Because G prime is neither positive or sorry, neither increasing nor decreasing. The reason that I want to point this out is that when we say G is neither concave up nor concave down, we are saying that capital G is linear. Linear functions have no concavity. So when we say G is neither concave up or concave down, another way to say this is that G is linear. So on the interval from two to three and from five to six, we're gonna draw G a straight line. Good questions. How's everybody okay? I've been like super stoked. Remember how Friday looks? When it's like, I just need to get through Friday so I can get to the weekend and put all my work off. That's what's happening this week, because next week is spring break. So it's going to be like a Friday that lasts five days. Because like, I just need to get through this week. I'll catch up over spring break. And when you say, I'll catch up over spring break, that means on Sunday night at the end of spring break, before Monday morning, you're going to try to do all the work that you intended to catch up on. If you're feeling called out right now, that's because I'm calling you out right now. If you're like, oh, no, that's not what I intend to do because I'm caught up on all my work, then obviously I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those of you who were students like I was a student. So I'll, I'll get caught up all over spring break. I won't worry about the shit that happened this week. I'll be able to catch up over spring break. Then at the end of spring break, oh, shit, I didn't just get to say that. I actually had to do work. And that's why I said my email to my professor. It's like, well, hey, can I get an extension on that term paper? Like some people, some students like procrastinate to the point where they have to ask for an extension. I'm so good at procrastinating. The day that the paper is due 
is the day that I email the professor to ask for an extension. That's the official start of my personal paper writing process. Like step one, wait till due date and ask for extension. Step two, hastily write paper. Step three, wonder why grade's so shitty. All right, that's gonna be it for today. Tomorrow we're gonna have another version of this problem. And uh, it'll be one where you work on the problem and then you turn it in at the end. And then I look at it on paper. So prep a problem like this. Probably I'll just take this. I might either just flip it over or just shift it and flip it. So it'll be the same kind of thing. That's it for today. I'll see you all on tomorrow, but have a good day and thanks for playing.